space of pentagons. The objective group includes a class of pentagons. So a pentagon has five vertices. Each vertex has two degrees of freedom. Five times two is ten. Minus eight, eight is the dimension of the projective group. So it's two-dimensional variety. Modular space of pentagons. And I give you five numbers. It's an overkill. You don't need five, but if you know those five numbers, you certainly know your pentagon. Uh, there are three interesting relations between these five numbers, which were known to Gauss, but that's a different story which I don't have time for. So anyway, uh, what I need to prove is that this uh, corner cross ratios are the same for the big pentagon and the small pentagon. So let's see this. Take vertex A and consider these four lines, and take the opposite vertex A prime of the small pentagon and consider its four lines. And you see that these four lines intersect this line oh. BE at the same four points. So the cross ratios are equal and the theorem is proven. Okay, now if you want to take home vertex size, here's the next one. If n is 6, uh, then the map is not identity, but the second relation is identity. That's a little hard to prove, but it's uh, possible to do it by the metric means. And now I want to show you a program, uh, software which was uh, created by H.E. Uh, Schwartz to study this. And everything we, we learned about this map uh, originally was learned by studying this uh, computer program. It, it, it's capable of many things, but uh, I will only show you a picture. Okay, so I hope everything converts. All right. So, um, you see uh, three screens here. So here you can choose your polygon. You can specify the number of sides. Currently it's seven, I think, if you want a different number of them. Seven images. Um, now, I will make it a little less regular because regular, of course, is a fixed point. And then I go to the other window where I can iterate. Okay, so this is uh, the iteration. I can change speed. Uh, I give you time to complain. Anyone wants to complain about something? This normalization is not quite projective normalization. It's more on a fine. You see, uh, there is a choice of uh, normalization. So projective normalization means that you fix four points, because four points can be fixed by projective normalization. The rest, obviously, if I change the normalization, you will see this picture. <laughs> so this is a true picture. So it's some kind of heartbeat, and if you stare long enough, you may see that the shape repeats itself. So it's, if not periodic, maybe quasi-periodic motion. You may wonder what happens if I change the realization to similarity. Okay. What was that? If I, just a Okay, if I, no, the other one. Okay, let's do it again. All right, so uh, similarity uh, in, means uh, normalization by similarity, so we keep, uh, say, area fixed, and the rest uh, is not is behind our control, and then uh, typically go uh, reach one dimensional state. But if we choose no normalization at all, then of course, everything fails. Okay, uh, enough of that. Could we see it a little slower? Uh, yes, how about that? Uh -huh. yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, it's, it's with me, so you can see slower single iterations. Alright. So, um, to be a little more uh, formal, uh, so let me introduce two, two spaces, two relevant spaces, where actually the action takes place. So one space is uh, the space of projective equivalence classes of n gons in the projective plane. Uh, it's called C, Cn, and as we already computed this, the dimension of this space is 2n minus 8. 2n degrees of freedom of the vertices minus a dimensional group of projective dimensions. Um, another space which is bigger, 8 dimensions bigger, is the space of so-called twisted polygon. So what is a twisted polygon? The twisted, what is a closed polygon? Those polygons uh, can be thought of as an infinite collection of points, such as the point number i plus n coincide with point number i. It's closed n block. Now, a more general uh, notion is the notion of twisted n block, where point 
So it's again an infinite collection of points in the vector plane, and point number i plus n is obtained from point number i by a fixed projective transformation, which is called monodrive. So here is the formal definition, which I don't want to read, but you see. So it's a bigger space, it's a dimensional bigger because I add uh, back uh, this monodrive, which is the projective transformation. So up to equivalence. Everything up to projective equivalence, yeah, and the map acts on that space as well. Yes. And the equivalence I don't formulate, but it's the, the obvious one. Okay, so uh, here's um, the uh, result uh, which uh, kind of opened uh, the gate. Um, it's a theorem um, due to Sienka, Schwartz, and myself, uh, saying that the Fentagram map is uh, completely integrable on the space of uh, twisted n gons. And complete integrability here means two things. It means that there are uh, there is a number of uh, integral, number of uh, conserved quantities. Namely, this number is exactly twice floor up n plus two. The third quantity means something on the space which is preserved by the map. Huh? Which is preserved by the map. Oh. I can't wait, I didn't see the map. Uh, right. You don't have to show me. Okay. No, I will. Oh, no, I see that. Okay. Okay. You draw short diagonals, so and important. everything is up to project. Okay. okay, fine. Alright, so there are that many integrals and they are independent. They are polynomials actually in, in something which you will see shortly. And then there is an invariant Poisson structure uh, which has a little kernel of dimension 2 or 4 depending on whether n is odd or even. And uh, such that uh, the integrals are sometimes new with respect to the Poisson structure. And in both cases, and even in odd, uh, there is a relation uh, which is good, I explained why it's good, uh, between the dimension and uh, the dimension of the kernel. Uh, number of integrals. So the dimension of the space minus current of the Poisson uh, bracket is twice the number of integrals minus current. So the, these Poisson structures are constant rank, they're actually symplectic on? Uh, they are uh, generic, but not. Uh, okay. are, uh, th 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 these spaces are very similar. I mean, there are all kinds of similarities. In general position, yes, it's constant rank. Right. But the similarities are not understood. You can start with the polygon for special. Yes, yeah, so some, so so some, some polygons are degenerate in some sense. Uh, this analysis is not, uh, not clear about what the description of the whole space is. So this is a theorem in general position. Okay, so this slide is kind of uh, explanation why that previous result is, is good. Uh, so what, what basically what one has is uh, a variation of uh, the space where we have the uh, X space uh, twist polygons class of modular space with pol polygons um, into uh, into uh, some spaces on which the motion is uh, quasi periodic. So this is a version of uh, Arnold Mobile integrability uh, with uh, instead of symplectic structure we have a Poisson structure here which has a kernel. So the general se setting is as follows: one has a smooth manifold, so I consider it open uh, and dense part of that space of the similarities. Uh, of dimension p plus 2q, where p and q are two numbers, and uh, a number of functions there. So there are p plus q functions of which first p uh, Poisson commute with everything, they're called Casimir functions, and the rest uh, just commute with each other. And uh, so in this situation, one can consider the foundation given by level surfaces of the first p functions, and on the leaves of this uh, foundation, the Poisson structure becomes symplectic, so we have symplectic foundation. Now, if we further consider the level sets of the remaining integrals, uh, which was not commuted with respect to each other, then one will have a Lagrangian relation of that symplectic, Lagrangian sub relation of symplectic relation, and uh, the leaves of that relation will carry a flat structure. The flat structure is given by commuting vector field, return vector fields of the uh, functions here of these integrals. And now, even in addition to all this, uh, one has a dynamical system. This can be a continuous time vector field or discrete time, a map which preserves all this data. Then it must preserve the flat fraction and therefore be parallel translation of the leaves. If uh, one knows that the leaves are compact, they are tori, and the motion is quasi periodic, it's uh, typically a rational translation of the torus. If we don't know that the leaves are compact, it's still a parallel translation, but not necessarily uh, quasi periodic motion. And one consequence of uh, this uh, general situation is a Poncelet style 
uh, theorem. So what is Poinsot theorem? Poinsot theorem is classical Poinsot theorem is that if you have two nested polar, uh, two nested ellipses, and you play the following game, you take a point on the outer one, you draw a tangent line to the inner one until you intersect the outer one, and then continue the same way. Suppose you come back after n steps. So here n is five. The claim is that you will come back after the same number of steps, five in this case, for every starting point. So the property to close up doesn't depend on where you start. It depends only on the configuration of two ellipses. This is a classical consolidated theorem. This is a consequence of this uh, invariability. Uh, in this situation, uh, if we have uh, one... This is only known in modern times. This was discovered 200 years ago by Ponsole when he was in Russian captivity during the oh. Napoleonic War. You say this is... But this, this, can be explained, this can be explained from a modern point of view. Okay. Yes, yes, it is certainly Ponsole did not discuss. Yeah, this is, by the way, Ponsole just said. Yeah, this was discovered in a uh, prisoner of war camp. Uh, believe it or not, but they had a mathematics seminar. Ponsole <laughs> <laughs> was very much involved in it. It's a good joke. I heard it there. So, uh, this is a consequence of complete integrability. Oh, uh, is Napoleon's uh, the bottom. Yeah. Uh, if you have uh, a manifold and matrix, if they have manifold in matrix, you could do it with parallel translation. If one point comes back, then every point comes back. It's a property of the leaf, not, not the one. Okay, so now let me elaborate on this a little bit. So, the first question is how to introduce coordinates in the space of. Uh, of this, on this mod modular space of polygons, equivalence class of polygons. Uh, the idea is uh, to use a local uh, invariants which are um, kind of discrete curvatures. So here's the construction. Uh, this is a piece of polygonal line. This is vertex i, i minus 1, i minus 2, and so on. Uh, so the construction involves five consecutive vertices. And if we extend the sides, uh, so I extend this side, this side, this side, and this side. And you see that on this side, four points are marked. So two vertices and two intersections with extensions of neophy sides. And likewise, on this side, four points are marked. And four points on a line have cross ratio. So what I have done is I assign to vertex number i two cross ratios, x i and y i, left and right cross ratio. OK? And this can be done in every vertex. And because the polygonal line is twisted polygon, so if you move n steps forward, you move by ejected summation, so cross ratios will be the same. So instead of infinitely many, coordinates we get exactly 2n. And 2n is the dimension of the space, so this is a global coordinate system. Again, it doesn't work in some general cases, but generically it works. It's, it's a uh, coordinate system in an open, dense subset. The very scope subset of this variety. Okay, so in this coordinates, the map uh, can be computed, and it's given by these coordinates. I will not read them, but uh, these are rational coordinates, not very complicated. Uh, star means new, new value, of course. No star means old value. So that's what this map is, and uh, at this point we can forget about geometry and just study the dynamics of this map, which is a map of two n-dimensional space. And by the way, this is the pentagram map or something like that. This is a pentagram map on the space of this okay. By the way, you, you can assume this uh, formulas over any field. It doesn't have to be real. Of course, genetically we think hard field, but it can be CD or fine field. Okay, so two consequences uh, of the formulas. One uh, is that there is a hidden symmetry, which is not genetical symmetry. So let me come back to the formulas. Uh, if you multiply each x by some number and divide each y by the same number, the formulas will stay the same. So the map can be used with the scaling symmetry, which you see here. And it doesn't seem to have a genetic to me. It doesn't act on actual polygons, it acts only on projected equivalence classes of polygons. But uh, this is certainly good news because uh, extra symmetry means more integrals. And you just formulas are. It looks like depending on the map of the scaling of the map everything. Right? Yes, but it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with what you're saying, but it doesn't have a genetic meaning. Remember, these are left and right coordinates. For example, if you change the orientation of your polygon, coordinates and momenta. I don't know whether. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so the second uh, consequence, easy consequence, is uh, that there are integrals which you just observe. If you multiply all x's, all the new, then the numerators and denominators will clear out, and the product of new x's is product of all x's, and likewise with y's. So we have two integrals which are called O and Em, O for odd and E for even. And likewise, if n is uh, even, uh, there are similar products, but you take only even uh, axes and only odd axes, multiply that. So these are um, is mere functions for the What's the word Casimir mean? What does it mean to be Casimir? Uh, what? What does this word mean, Casimir? Casimir means that uh, it will commute with everything with respect to Poisson break, which is not present. OK, now how to extract the rest of the data? Integrals from this easy ones. So, um, what you see here is a lemma, of course, or a theorem to which. Um, so, uh, basically, the idea is that the monodromy, or rather, conjugacy class of monodromy, is an invariant of the construction. Because uh, if construction is projected, if you move n steps forward, you are doing exactly the same thing. So, the question is how to extract information from the conjugacy class of monodromy. Monodromy is not a matrix, it's a projected transformation, but you can make it. And lift it. What is monodromy? Uh, monodromy, so. In then, this case, what does it mean? Yes. So the main object is a twisted polygon. The twisted polygon is uh, not a closed polygon. Yeah, but if no, you move then. That's uh, called a monodromy. Uh, that yeah, monodromy is what takes the vertex height of that type of stuff. And it's an invariant, I mean, it's conscious class is an invariant of everything. So here I'm telling you how to extract numbers uh, from this. So uh, first of all, consider monodromy as a matrix. Lift it to a matrix in a way. Um, Take trace, divide by a uh, cube root of determinants so that the number doesn't depend on the lift, and multiply by a combination of this easy invariance, uh, which is uh, also cube roots, and decompose what you get uh, into homogeneous components with respect to the scaling symmetry. So the claim is that what you get is a polynomial in coordinates x and y, and from this one poly polynomial you get many by decomposing into homogeneous components. And uh, so this is the meaning of the right hand side, homogeneous components of, of that thing as a function x and y, which is a polynomial function. And these are uh, this is uh, this constitutes half of the integrals. And now if you do the same thing with monodromy inverse, you will get the second half. So these are called O, O K, and there'll be D K, the other other half. So the three comes from the factor of three by three, right? Matrices? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, but uh, the fact that this is going on, you need to prove it is yeah. not a very important step. It's, it's a lemma. Almost everything I, I'm saying is, is a lemma or theorem. Yeah. So another theorem is that these integrals are independent. Uh, to check this, you need to check it at one point only, but it's a computation, which is done with the help of computer actually. And um, these uh, functions, these integrals are interesting on their own right, but I don't have time to say anything. They have combinatorial properties somewhat similar to symmetric polynomials, uh, and it's not well understood. Okay, now Poisson bracket. That's the last ingredient which I didn't uh, show you. It's very simple in this um, x y coordinates. It's log linear, so um, almost no variables interact. The only interaction takes place between neighboring x's and neighboring y's, and uh, when x's are neighbors, then their Poisson bracket is their product. Likewise, with y, it's the same. It's like the break group. Uh, they only interact. It's correct. Yeah, the other. except that it's a complete circle. Yes, and probably it means some. Well, you can do break. Yeah, yes, you break. Yes. Okay, so um, this, uh, this theorem about uh, complete integrability on the space of uh, twisted polygons doesn't imply what you saw uh, in the demonstration. In the demonstration, the polygon was closed. Now, the space of closed polygons is a small subspace, because you mentioned A sub subvarieties of the uh, space of uh, twisted polygons, and one needs to work uh, more to, to prove complete variability on that smaller space. And this was done in two separate uh, papers in two, two different ways. So, Fedor Solovyov, uh, who is now a Mazdor Taranta, he used algebraic uh, methods, algebraic genetical methods. And uh, we, we used uh, more or less the same approach as before, and both, both are published now. 
Okay, now uh, one other thing I want to tell you, just to whet your appetite of the subject and to say that this is a really good, good thing to study. I want to discuss um, very briefly the continuous limit of the pentagram. So what I mean by that? Um, if a polygon has very many sides, uh, it looks like a curve. So it's natural to expect that there is some kind of continuous uh, limit uh, of this situation uh, where polygons are replaced by curves. So let, let me describe this. So the object uh, which we want to study are non-degenerate, uh, which means no uh, inflection points, twisted uh, curves in the projected plane. Uh, twisted again means that the curve is not necessarily closed, but if you move, let's say, one unit uh, head, then the uh, curve is uh, changed by a fixed projected summation. Again, it's called monodromic. So it looks like so it's the properties of a smooth curve, the curve of geometric properties are varying on the projected transformation. Uh, for example, being globally convex, that's what they ask. Oh, non the yeah, non degenerate means no inflection points. So, so it means it's locally, kind of strictly convex locally at every point. That's yes, they yeah. So this is. Right. No. Exactly. Yeah. So it's convex. Okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be closed, but it's closed up to another curve. Okay, so this is the. The condition, and again we consider projective equivalent classes. So projective group X and everything inside that we consider quotient space. So what, the different way of saying it is that if you took a, a, a little annular neighborhood of your curve, that you could uh, actually put a, a projective structure on that for which the yes. Monodromia map was was well, the transformation. The Monodromia is a projective definition of the space. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yes. So it becomes, it becomes a closed curve in, in that context. Okay, so, um, all right, so now I want to, to in introduce an element of coordinates, so how to introduce coordinates on this modular space of curves. Uh, to do this, we need to lift curves to, to, to three-dimensional space. Projective plane is projectilization of three-dimensional vector space. So lift, lift is not unique, you can always scale when you lift, but there is a way to choose this lift uh, more or less canonically, namely a class that is determined to be a roughly determined to be equal to 1. So this defines the lift up to linear summations. And now you have a curve gamma capital, which is a curve in free space. And big a curve in free space, so the four vectors, gamma, gamma prime, gamma double prime, and gamma triple prime, must be linear, linear independent. So there is some linear uh, relation between these four vectors. And because of this determined condition, actually one of these vectors is not present. The actual linear relation is here. The third derivative is a linear combination of uh, position vector and the loss. Does it have to be this linear relation? Uh, well, four vectors in free space. Four vectors in free space. Gamma, gamma, gamma. They're all in the middle. They're all in the middle. Okay. okay. <laughs> and because this. <laughs> Good. So I'm glad I can answer some questions. Uh, well, this is a frame, yeah, so you, you can express the third one. All right, so, um, and still it's defi defined up to linear transformation. So uh, really, what we're talking about is a differential operator. Triple derivative plus some function times first derivative plus another function times, uh, times one. The space, the modular space of such curves is the space of this um, differential operator. And you can, you can say it's the space of pairs of two periodic functions, Q and V, one periodic functions, okay? Now, that's the space. Now, what's the transformation? What's the map? Uh, a technical detail. Uh, it's better to rewrite this differential operator in this form, which is uh, expressing this as a sum of uh, skew symmetric and symmetric operators. This is a minor technical detail, but uh, this is a classical detail, because in pre classical projective differential geometry, these two functions, u and w, uh, have names. They're called projective curvature and projective length element. So it's very nice to connect this subject to classical things. Okay, now what, what's the, the map? The map is uh, not a map anymore, it's a flow, it's a vector field. And this is presented here. So you have a curve, parametric curve, uh, gamma of x in the projected plane. And you consider two uh, points on the curve uh, where value of the parameter is x plus epsilon, x minus epsilon. So this is a line which moves as x varies. And a moving line, a projected plane, envelops a new curve. So a new curve here has a parameterization of the same x, 
Yeah, it depends on epsilon. Now, what happens if epsilon is uh, going to zero? Uh, we have a flow, really. It's, it's a vector field which stands this to this. Funding has considered to limit that epsilon goes to zero. And in terms of these functions, u and w can be completed. It's a computation. And it turns out that the first meaningful term is actually epsilon squared. There is no term involving epsilon first to be. And we define a flow on the space of, say, differential operators uh, by uh, saying that time evolution of these two functions equal the first non-trivial term, which is, again, what we say, the coefficient of epsilon squared. And then a computation tells you what it is. So these are the actual formulas. One can get rid of one of the functions, w, and uh, present it as a partial differential equation on one of the functions, u, and this differential equation is recognizable. It's a Brusinesk equation. So um, Brusinesk equation is a well-studied uh, completely in the, in the whole system of solid on type. And in this sense, we can say that pentagram map is a discretization of Brusinesk, both time-wise and space-wise. What's is, the meaning of this change from epsilon to uh, epsilon squared? Somehow, well, you have some, some singularity somehow. Uh, no, I think uh, the meaning is uh, that if you have a convex uh, curve and you, you consider something like, like this, so if oh, this, part, if, if if this square, is a size yeah, epsilon, this is a, yes, okay. that's all there is. Okay, now uh, before I start my second uh, half, uh, I want to mention something which I cannot mention due to lack of time. So as I say, uh, there is some activity, there is some activity in this uh, area. Uh, involving various things. So uh, there are interesting configuration theorems of projective, uh, projective, trigonometric projective geometry, which uh, Schwartz and I discovered again playing with computer. Uh, the very last slide of my talk will present one of these uh, configurations. If you are interested, you will ask me later. Uh, there is an interesting computerics, as I mentioned, uh, related to these integrals, uh, which is not completely understood. There is some work on algebraic computerics uh, of so called freeze patterns, uh, which are related to. This pentagram map, and uh, they are also very much related to cluster algebras, but I can't talk about this right now. There's a work of uh, Max uh, Glick and uh, Rinat Kedem on uh, pentagram map uh, and its relation to cluster algebras and YMT systems, so called. Some work on singularities, you asked about singularities. So there is one paper by uh, Max Glick where he analyzes some singularities which arise in this context, but it's not completely uh, understood. Uh, there are various uh, versions of multidimensional pentagram map. Uh, I will talk about one of them, but uh, another uh, directional work is due to Kaysen and Soladio, and also to Gloria Marie Beta. Um, there is a very interesting uh, work on relation of this system to loop groups and cluster algebras by Koch and Moshakov. And um, there is a recent uh, preprint by Maria Genoa, Sient, and myself, and also by Igor Grishevier on computerics of computerial version of scale transforming community with different operators, also inspired by the other. Okay, so I switch gears and I'm talking now about the work which is still in progress uh, with Gaffman Shapiro and uh, Weinstein. Uh, we published a short ver uh, version of this uh, in registration announcements, but uh, the full version is not written yet, so some themes are better for. Conjecture because full proofs are not written yet. Okay, so the um, starting point is to change coordinates. Uh, I don't have time to motivate this uh, change, so just take it as, as presented. Uh, so I switch from big letters to small letters uh, and introduce small variables x, i, and y, i related to the previous coordinates of x and y capital by these formulas. And if we rewrite the map in these new coordinates, it's also given by rational expressions, which are not more complicated nor less complicated than the previous ones. But if you take these formulas, you will start to notice that there is a parameter here. So this two actually can maybe can be changed to some k, maybe a parameter. And what we consider is a one parameter family of names, uh, which are denoted by t sub k, and given by these two formulas. For k even and odd, the formulas differ a little bit, and r in this formulas is lower half k minus one. So basically, we introduce a one parameter family of maps, which include pentagram map for the value of parameter k equal to two. The meaning of this two, of this k, is dimension. 
So the actual, the initial category map takes place in projective plane. Plane is two-dimensional. So when k is bigger, we are talking about high-dimensional category maps. When k is smaller, can be one, we are talking about lower dimension. This is probably the most interesting one because it's not clear what you can do in one-dimensional situation. What is the polygon of the projective line? Just a of points. But there is no room to draw diagonals. You can't intersect anything. But nevertheless, you can do it. But this is how you of this geometric interpretation. Uh, I'll tell you. They have some interpretation, but first I want to do algebraic work, and then uh, the last the last thing will be a genetic interpretation. So I want to make full circle from geometry to formulas, formulas generalized, uh, complete integrability improved, and then back to geometry. Okay, so to study this map, uh, we use a technique of uh, weighted directed networks. And um, this is um, the main reference is a preprint by uh, Postnikov, which is, as you can see, not very recent. Uh, this paper is not published and more or less uh, not finished. Uh, Postnikov updates this from time to time. Um, it's a long paper uh, which introduces this. Uh, Gadgets and uses to study these problems. Mm, there is also a book by my co authors, uh, Gatman, Shapiro, and Weinstein, uh, called Cluster Algebras and Poisson Geometry, uh, MS 2010, where this techniques is introduced in, and studied in detail. I don't have time to give you formal definitions, so I'll do everything by example. So here's an example uh, this is a directed network, weighted network, so it's a graph. Uh, directed graph, uh, which has versions of two kinds. There are black ones and white ones. A black one has two incoming and one outgoing edge. A white one has one incoming and two outgoing edges. Uh, the edges are marked by variables. So the condition is that if you don't have, if you don't see a uh, marking, it's one. So for example, this edge is marked one. I don't uh, dry, uh, the right one, uh, this edge is x, this edge is y. There are three, in this example, there are three uh, incoming and three outgoing edges, and they are labeled one to three, one to three. And then there is a special uh, curve here, which is called cut and labeled lambda, and this is used to introduce a parameter in all constructions. So, spectral parameter, as we call it. So, given such a graph, one creates a matrix. In this example, it would be three by three matrix, which is called boundary measurement matrix. And think of this as um, maybe electrical current through some uh, electrical uh, scheme, and you, you you know what's going in. You want to measure what uh, goes out. So the rule is as follows. Uh, in this example, again, uh, so it's a three by three matrix. If uh, I need to compute the entry number i j of this matrix, I take the incoming edge i and outgoing edge j, so 1, 3, for example, 1 and 3, and then I, I consider all paths in this graph going from 1 to 3, and for every path I multiply the labels on the edges, and then I add up. So let's do it in one example. So from 1 to 3, there is one way to go from 1 to 3 uh, directly horizontally, and that will be 1 times y times 1, that is y. And then there is a second way to go right, up, right, down, right. And that will be 1 times x times 1, 1, 1. So altogether, x plus y. And that's what you see in this matrix here. OK? And the lambda is way too. And lambda is when you intersect, when a path intersects this uh, cut, you multiply that lambda. So lambda here, going from 2 to 1, there's only one way. Would be one, but you intersect lambda, so you want to have one. So this is the pictorial way. Uh, if you consider two such graphs and consider their concatenation, so put one adjacent to another, this is multiplication of matrices. So it's a graphical way to represent product of matrices. Okay. Um, there is a group of equivalences, gauge group acting on this uh, objects. What you can do without changing the uh, measurement matrix is to multiply uh, the labels, the weights of every incoming edge at the vertex by some number and to divide the weights of outgoing edges by the same number. This will not change the matrix, so this group acts on 
uh, with the graphs. Uh, there is a way to introduce on the space of the face of such a graph uh, on some bracket. So basically, there are two kinds of features. Uh, the only interaction in this Poisson bracket takes place when the uh, three edges are adjacent to each other. And then there are um, two kinds of features. There are white and black uh, vertices. And uh, you have three adjacent uh, edges, x1, x2, x3. And uh, depending on which of the Poisson brackets you want to consider, x1, x2, or x1, x3, or x2, x3, there are three cases. So all together, there are six different cases. And the brackets are always of the same kind as you saw before, log linear. So when uh, variables interact, it's a product. And this uh, constants can be chosen arbitrarily. But because of the pH group and some other things which I don't want to mention in lack of time, uh, there's a canonical choice. So there's a canonical choice for some bracket on the space of edge weights, which is invariant under gauge group, so in the quotient space of gauge group. Finally, there are moves. There are, these are local moves, like local moves in North theory, like randomized moves, uh, which involve only a part of the picture, small part of the picture, and they're called positive moves, and um, one, two, and three, and they're shown here. So you take a small part of your graph, and you change it accordingly, changing the picture, the graph, and the weights. These two are similar, and this is the most complicated one. It's like the device three. In some sense, uh, it's, uh, it involves squares and uh, changes the weights as the show. This moves do not change the and final. Change the colors. Uh, change the colors as well, yes. Well, the colors depend on how many go in and out. Black is when you have two incoming, one outgoing, and white is when you have two outgoing, one incoming. Yes, that also changes. Okay, so this moves uh, do not change the boundary uh, measurement matrix. They are lo local. And finally, I introduce the graph which uh, describes the max which you saw here. So, which you saw earlier. Let me once again flash the maps. So, these are the formulas which I want to interpret in terms of this networks. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, what you see here is a picture which is drawn on a torus. Of course, what you see is a flat screen, but you should think of this as a torus. Uh, first of all, as a cylinder. So you see that part of the screen, which is here, and there is an opposite side, side of the screen. So for example, this curve goes on that side, and then on the opposite side. On our side, and then the opposite side. Okay, so it's only a cylinder. And also, the cylinder is pasted into a torus. So uh, this end and this end are connected together according to the weight. So one to one, two to two. So what you see here is uh, a graph which consists of, so this, this graph corresponds to parameters k equal to 3 and m equal to, to 5. So 5 is how many copies of the same thing we see here. You remember, this was my example, and it's repeated here five times. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? Each time with a twist. So it's a concatenation of five graphs which we saw before here, this graph. So that's explanation of 5. And uh, K3, that's how many, for example, lines we have here. OK, so uh, this is a graph on the torus. Uh, its faces are squares and octagons. Uh, well, this has eight sides, so it's an octagon, this is a square. And uh, the transformation of this graph is as follows. So we do Postnikov move number 3 on each square. We change each square according to this. And then we move uh, by positive to moves 1 and 2 so that we restore the same picture. And we also use the gauge group to restore ones where they belong. And eventually we obtain the same graph but different weights. And the, so schematically, I can, cannot do this in one example because it's a long repetition, but schematically we start with a picture like that. We do mutations on all squares. This, uh, Move three, and then we rearrange things by moves one and two and gauge group, obtain exactly the same graph but with new weights. And the new weights are precisely the ones given by those points. So our family of maps is interpreted in this terms. What good does it do? Uh, the good outcome is that complete rebuild of these maps is suggested by the picture, by the dynamics of the network. So first of all, Poisson brackets, I mentioned this in general, but in our situation, this is uh, the invariant Poisson bracket. Well, we have the my word on this, but uh, this is a straightforward computation. Uh, 
the uh, well, some bracket has a kernel, a real kernel, which is the dimension two or four, just as in the standard pentagram or classical pentagram, uh, depending on whether n and k are even or, or, or odd. The Casimir function, which commutes, Poisson commutes with everything, are products of all x and of all y's, and in the proper parity case, also products of only even and only odd x's and y's. The matrices, uh, boundary measurement matrices, which represent blocks of which this graph is uh, constructed, is here. For k equal to 3 or greater, this is the matrix, boundary, matrix, boundary measurement matrix for one block. And the product of this will be the whole thing. When k is 2, it's a special case because uh, it's much smaller. The matrix looks like this. So the boundary me measurement matrix for the whole thing is the product of this plus matrices. And integrals are extracted from there as uh, conditions of Cartesian polynomial. So this is formula. Everything depends on lambda. We take uh, the Cartesian polynomial of this uh, matrix as a polynomial lambda and decompose into homogeneous components. And what we get is a complete set of integrals and they are independent. In the case of pentagram map, this restores the, what, what we saw previously and what was initially constructed by bare hands. Okay. Now back to Germany. What's the meaning of all this? So the interpretation differs uh, depending on whether k, the dimension of the vector space, is 3 or higher, or it's 2, so the projective space is just one dimension. The formulas do, don't know anything about the dimensions, and they look alike, but the geometry differs. So in high dimensional situations, uh, we start with the space uh, of uh, twisted n bonds in projective space of dimension k minus 1. And this uh, large space is dimension uh, is n times k minus 1. So again, let's do this. Counting uh, each vertex has k minus 1 degrees of freedom. It's an n bond, so n times k minus 1. Um, there is a monodromy. What happens if you move n steps forward? So this adds the dimension of the projective group. And then we factorize the projective group. We subtract the same thing. So this is the dimension of this big space. We consider a small, uh, much smaller subspace, which consists of polygons which we call corrugated. Probably it's not the best term, but somehow we are used to it. So the corrugated polygon is the following. Consider the, the four vertices of a polygon as follows. So vertex number i, vertex number i plus 1, vertex number i plus k minus 1, and vertex number i plus k. So four vertices of a polygonal line in high dimensional space. Generally speaking, they should span three dimensional space. But we ask this quadruple to span two dimensional space. So in other words, we ask two diagonals which are i and i plus k minus 1, i plus 1 and i plus k to intersect. In projective space, there are no parallel lines, so they intersect. k equals 5 in the previous diagram of the board? Uh, no, it was 3. three. Uh, yeah, in uh, this... Uh, oh, k is dimension. Yes, k is dimension of vector space, so k minus 1 dimension of vector So this corresponds to a pentagram map on with pentagons in projective Not the case, but... Yeah, here. All right, so actually, this is a good uh, slide because this is a, uh, an example of five corrugated, corrugated octagon. So, what you see is uh, a cube, a skeleton cube, and as a, as a polygonal line, it's corrugated in the sense that vertices 0, 4, 1, and 5 are in the same plane, 1, 5, 2, 6 are in the same plane, 2, 6, 3, 7 in the same plane, so. Of course, this should sit in a bigger dimensional space. What I draw is three dimensional, but uh, there's a relation between uh, this shift and dimension. So k minus one is dimensional and then projective space, and shift is precisely by k minus one. Okay. All right. So this is a subspace of the space of polygons, and because we force these diagonals to intersect, we can define pentagram the same way as before. So you, for every i, we intersect this line i i plus k minus 1, i plus 1, i plus k. The new intersection point is a vertex of a new polygon, and the claim is that what we obtain is again corrugated. So this property of the corrugated is inherited by this map. The map is well defined in the space of corrugated polygons. That's another level. Um, I think that actually this notion is uh, 
somewhat interesting uh, from genetical point of view. For example, uh, a polygon which is projected with dual, dual corrugated is also corrugated. So this is something inherently genetical about this notion. But anyway, we have this subspace and we can define a map. And um, the claim is that the polygons you saw describe that map on the space of corrugated polygons. So let me elaborate a little bit on that. Um, the question again is how to introduce coordinates. So one thing we know about uh, projective geometry is that it's better to, to think projectively, but it's better to compute linearly. If you want to do some computation projective geometry, it's better to move things into a vector space. And that's precisely what we do here. So we have a polygon, polygonal line in projective space. We lift every vertex to vector space. There is a choice, of course, you can scale when lifting. Uh, but um, as before, if we lift four points, which were projectively dependent, which uh, belong to the same projective plane, then in the lift we'll have a linear relation between these four points. And because we can scale things, we can actually make sure that one of the conditions of this linear relation is fixed. So what I think is we can lift four consecutive four vertices of our original line, i, i plus k, i plus k minus 1, and i plus k, in such a way that the linear relation between last and previous t uh, uh, keeps one of the coefficients equal to 1. We can choose scaling in such a way. And then there are two other coefficients which we cannot control, and these coefficients are coordinates. So we do it for every i, and we introduce 2n coordinates, x i, i from 1 to n, y i, I from 1 to n, and this is a global coordinate system of the space of this corrugated polygon. So the claim is that in terms of these coordinates, the map which I described geometrically when you intersect diagonals is described by the coordinates which you saw before. Uh, these coefficients also can be interpreted geometrically as cross ratios. Everything you do in projective geometry is eventually cross ratio. And this is the explanation how to do this. So again, vertex i, vertex i plus 1 vertex uh, uh, i plus k minus 1, vertex i plus k, so these four lie in the same plane, intersect. These four lie in the same plane, also intersect. So what you see is a line and four points on it, and it gives you a translation. And you can do the same thing, uh, extending sides, so that's the interpretation of those coordinates. Okay, so now I come to my last thing, and this is uh, somewhat unexpected. So again, the formulas don't care. If you take k equal to 2, which would mean k minus 1 is 1, you are doing some version of pentagram map in the projective line. But the projective line is too small to draw polygons, to draw diagonals, no room for that. So what is the, what, what's happening here? So I'll tell you two, two, two ways to interpret this. So the first um, interpretation, which works over any field, uh, is as follows. So the map will act on not on one polygon, but on a pair of polygons. So what is it, again, what is a polygon projective line? Polygon projective line is an infinite collection of points such that point number i plus n is a definite point number i by the projective summation, which is an obvious summation of this. So we consider two twisted n bonds with the same monogram called S minus and S. Minus means previous generation, and S means current generation. And the map will uh, send such a pair so S minus S to a new pair, S, S plus. So the current generation becomes previous generation, and the next generation will be defined by a genetical construction. OK? Uh, all right, so uh, I means vertex number I, or the polygon of the current or previous generation. Um, because everything is defined, should be defined in mode project deformations, uh, we introduce coordinates x and y, the ones which you saw in the formulas, by some cross ratios, and these are the formulas. Well, they look like cross ratios. This is exactly cross ratio, and this is multiple cross ratio. And these are coordinates of the space of pairs of such polygons, modular trajectory. Okay, now the map. So I, I need to tell you how to construct S plus, the polygon of next generation, if you know the previous two. The rule is local, uh, involves only, vert, uh, only vertex number i and its neighbors, and it's a leapfrog rule. So here's the picture. So here's a vertex number i of current generation, two previous, uh, two, two neighbors, vertex number i minus one, i plus one, 
happened generation, and vertex number i of the previous generation. The rule is that this point jumps over this point and moves the same distance, but the distance should be measured in projective terms. So there is a way to, there is a projective uh, metric on, on a segment on a projective line, uh, which is given by natural logarithm of cross ratio. Uh, or better said, maybe more conceptually, it's the metric whose motions are projected to some which preserve the segment. And that's the distance which I need. So again, this distance equals this distance in the metric on that segment on that projected metric. Okay. So that's the rule. It happens at every point. This means just that uh, the uh, cross section change the same? No, no. no? Uh, this uh, involves five points, right? Well, actually, what it means is <laughs> next next slide. So, so this is a very dynamically reflection about the center. It's a reflection, yes. Uh, so the yeah. out, out of the two points to infinity, out that's of the right. points That's right, yes, yes, in the logical process. Yeah, but the change is generation, so the previous generation becomes next generation. And this happens everywhere, at every point. So in formulas, uh, these are three equivalent uh, formulas which describe this. This is probably most symmetric. And finally, okay, I saw the one minute. Uh, finally, there is an interpretation over complex field. So over complex field, um, projective line is not one-dimensional anymore. It's one-dimensional I mean, one complex, but it's two-dimensional real. And one thing which you can draw and think about are circles. Circles are defined in this geometry. And here is Möbius' uh, uh, interpretation, circular interpretation of this summation. So again, I have three points of the current generation and one point of the previous generation. So here's the construction. Consider this circle through point i, i minus 1, and previous i here. And then consider the circle which is tangent to this one through points si and si plus 1. This one. Okay? That's the well defined thing. Yeah. So three points define a circle, two points define a circle, tangent to this one. Okay? Now do it similarly for si, si plus 1, and si previous. Circle and circle tangent to it. And finally, these two new circles intersect with the new point, which is S by next generation. So that's the method. That's the rule. And um, we were quite uh, happy when we saw this picture because uh, this was studied before by Adet Shram uh, in his work on discrete uh, complex uh, table. Um, so this circle patterns are new, not new, and well, actually somewhat studied, and it's very nice that they are connected to this better than that. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful talk. Let's see if there are any questions. When somebody in the Linux says that he needs to have a method, he wants to immediately do petrosis map. So is there any nice, interesting geometric way of petrosis map? Kind of not so complicated. Very well. Curvature features. I don't know, it's already projected, so it's not about I don't know. It seems to be a rich subject. I would be surprised, but I don't know. Okay. So what is the level of boostiness equation for the multi-dimensional case? Good question. I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, so like I say, our full paper is not written yet, uh, and this is one of the things we hope to, to do. Um, so, could you explain the question? Hmm? Could you repeat or yes. explain the question? Uh, right. So, uh, in, in the claim, if a polygon becomes has infinite domain size, it can be thought of as, as, as a curve. As and on, on, a, on a space of curves, you will have this flow, uh, which in some importance, uh, is precise equation. So we have a version of a known equation. A known equation. Yeah. Well understood equation. Yeah. Um, okay, so in high dimensional situation we still have polygons and they still make up in the domain sites and uh, that would be a non degenerate in some proper sense, curve in the projective space. And uh, chances are yeah, and then there should be an analog of uh, corrugated. So there should be a corrugated notion. I mean in in, in our curve, I'll say something like that. Other people's ideas. Um, 
And that would be, uh, so what that would be, mean that um, it's a parametric curve, and if you move, shift a parameter by a fixed uh, number, then the two points and two, two tangent lines should be coplanted. Okay? So if that, this is the case, you can still define the um, envelope of this uh, line connecting the respective point parameter, and uh, the, this line will envelop a new curve, so the, the, and you can consider the limit. It seems all doable, but the equation which we try to compute didn't seem recognizable, not, not to us. If you are interested, I can dig and show you, but I don't know. There's a different version of high-dimensional country grammar, more general, uh, which was studied by Kaysen and Solovyov, and also by Marie, uh, by Gloria and Marie Beffa. And uh, they involve different kind of constructions uh, without any assumption like corrugated. So if you have a polygonal line in high-dimensional space, you can imagine taking several uh, points, assuming flats, and intersecting these flats, shifting indices. And if you take the right number of points, the right number of intersecting uh, planes, uh, eventually you'll have one point. And uh, they described a class of such maps where also complete variability can be determined. Can improve. And uh, it seems that in their situation, you can also generalize the, the curves. There's a limit. And we, this would produce more general equations, which should contain ours as, as particular things. And again, they, they wrote some formulas, and no one was able to recognize it. So it's, I would say it's open. So it's too long to answer for saying we don't know. OK. Any further questions? If not, uh, before we thank you. The speaker again, there will be dinner tonight, and Bolik will be in chapter 10, so stay after the talk. So, thank you again.